Thank you for being with us again this week on our Bible study from the campus of Appalachian Baptist Church in Greer, South Carolina. I'm Butch Howard, and we appreciate you joining us today. I hope that you are enjoying the festivities of the holiday season, and I know that this year uh, things are very, very different. Uh, states are being told to stay at home. Uh, travel has diminished. Uh, of course, the social planning and uh, events that we normally uh, are used to as a part of the Christmas and holiday season are being canceled uh, and radically altered. But I hope that in the midst of all of this, we are celebrating the birth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's him who has loved us and gave himself for us. He came in this world as a babe so that he could live the life we would never be able to live and he died the death that we must have uh, for our redemption. And we trust him today as our Lord and our Savior. So Merry Christmas to each of you as we move now into the heart of the month of December. Of course, the new year uh, is just ahead of us. And most of us are already thinking uh, considerably about how the new year is going to look uh, for our country and our world. Certainly our churches, our uh, ministry team here, we're trying to look ahead and see uh, how we can minister uh, as a faithful, fruit-bearing church uh, in the realities of our present time. So I hope that you're praying for local churches. Pray for your local church, your pastoral team. Uh, pray for the leadership as, as we look beyond the... Uh, the difficulties, if you will, of the present moment and try to focus on carrying out the Great Commission. Of course, for us Southern Baptists, this is Lottie Moon season, and if you haven't already given an offering to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, I hope that you will choose to do that. Our international missionaries depend upon the generosity and faithful giving of Southern Baptists all over the world. So I hope that you will consider that. Uh, I believe that the uh, International Mission Board does one of the most incredible jobs of any group of people anywhere in the world on getting the gospel to the ends of the earth. So I hope that as you plan your giving, you will uh, give to the uh, Lottie Moon International Mission Offering for uh, International Missionaries. Today, as we continue our What Now? post-election realities for the church, I hope that you will join me as we find our way to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. Now, we have uh, spent several sessions dealing with our mission, and we are learning as we study our mission that even though the times are changing, even though the times are turbulent, even though these are very different than any other times we have experienced in our lives. The mission of the Great Commission, the mission of being salt and light, these things have not changed at all. God requires of us, this is not suggestion, this is not one of those optional things to take or leave. We are commanded to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. We are commanded to make disciples of those who believe. We are commanded to be salt and to be light. We're to share the love of God, but also the truth of God uh, in every part of our lives. So we focused considerably on the mission. We want today to begin to shift that focus just a little bit, and we need to, to understand the culture in which we are carrying out this mission. We in the United States of America, we have been blessed for all of our lifetime, now about 246 years, uh, our nation that was founded upon biblical Christian principles. It was, the, the economy was founded upon the Judeo-Christian work ethic. Uh, we believe uh, that people should work and, and they should gain in proportion to their labor. And this is why we're capitalists and we're not socialist. Uh, this is the biblical values that have been espoused now for uh, these 200, almost 250 years uh, of, the, of the nation. So 
we, we see now that cultural underpinning is shifting. In fact, it's shifting radically. It's not simply just a, a political uh, shift. It is a paradigm shift. There's the whole underneath, the foundationing of the nation is crumbling from this old way, and underneath it is being built a globalist foundation. So we need to understand the culture as much as we can. Now, you and I who are followers of Jesus Christ, it's vitally important that we get our truths from the Word of God. Our understanding needs to be informed on the basis of Scripture. There are good public speakers out there. There are some great patriots out there. There's good books that are available, but none of those will do us as much good as getting in the Word of God because here we have our foundation of truth upon which we can stand regardless of what the culture may or may not do in the coming days, weeks, months, and years. So today in Romans chapter 1, we want to be looking uh, at the culture. Culture basically is the reaction of humanity to its environment. Uh, when we talk about culture, humanity uh, comes together in groups. Uh, we Sometimes these are communities of, in some places. They're villages and towns, cities, states, nations. These cultures react to the realities of life in their own manner, their own way. And we call these cultural differences. We group this under a title called cultural diversity. Not all of our cultural responses or reactions are appropriate or beneficial, and certainly they are not always biblical. For the child of God, we need to understand the difference between biblical culture and anti-biblical culture, and we need to see how we are to minister to the king and his kingdom in the midst of this anti-Christian, anti-biblical culture in which we live. Romans chapter 1 helps us with these things. Romans chapter 1 tells us, if you basically want to understand these are the why human humanity has rejected God. Romans 1 tells us why humans reject God. Now, the next few weeks, we'll also be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, and, and we will find out how that rejection has affected and altered humanity, and that's a very important study. So that's coming down the pipe in, in coming weeks. But why has culture abandoned God? Why has America, over now 200, almost 250 years, slowly but consistently and persistently walked further and further away from its biblical foundations and its divine hand of blessing? We need an answer to this question. Why has the culture shifted? The answer is not Republican or Democrat or Independent. The answer has nothing to do with politics at all. There's five things, five markers, if you will, that will help us understand. They're right here in the first chapter of Romans. Now, I'm going to try to go slow because it's so important that we understand the why. I have always, I've always been one of those why people. Don't tell me what we're going to do unless you're going to explain to me why we're doing it. When we see things happening around us, it's important not to have a knee-jerk reaction. It's important that we not simply have an emotional reaction. It's important that we understand the why things are as they are. Now, we talked about personal circumstances, personal experiences, and personal realities, and we've also seen the uh, global circumstances and the events and the realities that those events have created. So as we look at this today, I want us to watch these markers. These five markers will tell us why the culture is walking away from God. Now listen, you can explain yourself to, a Christ, to an unbeliever every day, but what you're going to find is more and more of those who are not believers 
refused to even entertain the reasoning upon which we have become followers of Jesus Christ. They reject it out of hand. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to discuss it. They certainly refuse to embrace it. So let's look at it. Now, there's quite a lengthy portion here from verse 21 down uh, through verse 32, and I'm not going to take the time to read all of these verses. I'm going to highlight them as we move through here. But I encourage you, dear friend, you need to get in the Scriptures. Take what we give you today. Study, pray, meditate over these things. Uh, get in the Scriptures and see what the Bible says about these cultural markers. Number one, culture rejects the, the revealed truth regarding God. Look at verse 21. Romans 1, 21, Paul writes, because that when they knew God, put parentheses around that, knew God. God has revealed himself to humanity. God has revealed himself in creation. We read in, here in Romans 1, he's revealed himself uh, to humanity through the scriptures. He has revealed himself to humanity through his miraculous works. And then he revealed himself to humanity through the person and work and life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But when they knew God, look what he says, they glorified him not as God. In other words, they did not ascribe to him deity. They refused to acknowledge his divine nature, his, the infinity and eternality and omnipotence and omniscience and omnipresence of his being. They refused to glorify him as God. Neither were they thankful. But became, that word became, underline that word became, because there is a progression here. He didn't say that they were vain in their imagination, but they became vain in their imagination. Became is a progression. In this case, it's a digression. It's a going away from. It's a deterioration. It's a corrupting. It is a breakdown. So what happens is when culture rejects God as he reveals himself to humanity, then there is a breakdown of the culture. There is a digression. There is a progression of things that now begin to fall into place as that culture rejects God. Culture has, in every culture in human history, there's been this tendency, and there's always the uh, historical trend away from recognizing and honoring God. It says they became vain or empty in their imaginations. In other words, they no longer could entertain thoughts that pertain to God. All they had up here basically is garbage, uh, crazy imaginations. This is where fantasy and you know, so much of our science fiction, so much of our entertainment media and uh, the cyber games and the role playing and perversions, all of these things are basically products of this empty imagination. And we already see that this is getting worse and worse as time moves on. Today, we've created so many things that in my childhood uh, didn't exist and nobody even imagined them. Virtual reality, alternative reality, uh, uh, augmentation, uh, this is all these things uh, that now uh, are commonplace. Uh, one of the hottest gifts this Christmas uh, is virtual reality games, uh, the equipment where they can actually put themselves into a virtual environment and interact as a present occupant in that environment. For us older folks, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this, but it's real. And so this empty imagination is a marker. It is a byproduct of the cultural degeneration. And this cultural degeneration is occurring because 
Culture rejects the truth of God. That brings us to the second one. Culture then, after rejecting the revealed truth, culture relies, number two, relies upon human understanding and reasoning. Look at what he says in verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And there's that word became again, a progression. It wasn't overnight. It wasn't instantaneous. Back in the early part of the 20th century, we began to have critical thinking applied to scriptures. There was this in spiritual enlightenment, it was called, and people, human beings, were critiquing the Word of God. Now, that's dangerous business. What we ended up with was a bunch of corrupt translations and even more corrupt interpretations. We have all sorts of flawed, false, literally satanic interpretations that have come out of this human reasoning, this God of our own understanding. The worst part of it is that we profess ourselves to be enlightened and wise. God sees us as fools. The psalmist says, the fool has said, in his heart, there is no God. It's foolish. When a person declares that God doesn't exist, he's foolish. God's word, not mine. Listen, it doesn't matter how many degrees that person might have. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how well read in secular resources that person may be. A person who believes God does not exist is a fool. Those who believe themselves to be so enlightened they can critique the word of God. They too are fools. It's foolish. The word of God is authoritative. It was never meant for us to be fully understanding of it all. But it is worthy of our full unconditional trust. So they believe of themselves to be wise, and they become fools in verse 22. This culture now relies upon the human understanding. Now, we see this all the time. Even in churches, people will say in, in, in personal conversation, well, I know what the Bible says, but I believe this. I believe God intended that. Listen, when we put those words into that sentence, we are treading very, very, very shaky ground. It is not my business to affirm the Word of God. It's my business to agree with the Word of God and conform my life according to it. That's the old way of thinking, I know. It's old-fashioned, but it's biblical. We're not in the business of getting God to agree with us. Unfortunately, many think that way. No, no, no. We are in the business of agreeing with what God has said. And unless we're in that business of agreeing with God, we're going to be wrong every time. Wrong every time. They profess themselves to be wise and they became fools. We see this culturally more and more and more. If you engage in social media today and you begin to post things regarding your personal faith, you have already had comments posted uh, directly to you or about you or in that conversation thread that suggest that you are not quite right, that you might not be so well informed. You might even be ignorant or you might even be evil. There's all sorts of this, this cultural intolerance against biblical Christianity. And it has prompted many Christians to become silent. It's caused a lot of believers simply to say, I will withdraw from the discussion. We can't do this, folks. God called us to be salt and light. God called us to be ambassadors for the kingdom. God called us to take a stand, to be unashamed of him in the public, public domain. 
We have a mandate, and we are on mission. We cannot be intimidated by a culture that has reasoned itself to be wiser uh, than God. Number three, the culture not only rejects revealed truth, the culture relies upon human understanding and reasoning, but number three, culture changes the truth of God into lies. Look, verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. They worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now watch. In this verse, we see that the culture changes truths. Now this is, again, it's not done all at once. We have, over my lifetime, we've watched public education, the entire American education system, the American education system, I should say, has become more and more, and they use the word progressive, but really it's secularized. It's secularism. It's, and the word secular, listen, let's understand this word. Secularism is about taking spiritual matters, religious matters, matters of faith out of the domain of discussion. It is arriving at conclusions. It's arriving at policy decisions. It's ar arriving at moral values independent of and exclusive of spiritual concepts and spiritual values. That's secularism. Secular humanism, when we join those two words together, it's saying that there is no God. Mankind must save itself. It has completely ex excluded God. Now, it has also created its own bed of lies that will affirm and support this fallen Luciferian ideology. The culture of our time is so anti-God and it's built an entire systematic underpinning that crosses all of the cultural uh, avenues that we can discuss. The media, entertainment, sports, uh, fads, trends, uh, economics, politics, even faith uh, has been watered down. So there is this huge systematic cultural shift that now says the truth is a lie, and the lie is the truth. How, how effective has this been? How ingrained has this become? Well, now, today, in 2020, we talk about 51 gender identities. 51 gender identities. And when I was growing up, when you were growing up, most of you, there was two identities, two gender identities. You were male or you were female. That's it, male or female. By the way, that's, that's the biblical. God created male and female, created he them. So, listen, that's how effective. We now no longer use gender-specific uh, pronouns in certain circles. Uh, that's considered offensive. So this, this cultural re-indoctrination, re-education is quite thorough. It is now very firmly in place, and it is now displacing the old system of biblical Christianity and biblical morality. So this is where we are in the culture. Change the truth of God into lies. It's very important that we understand that once we start down this path to cultural uh, reimagination, restructuring, this, uh, this new way of thinking, this post-Christian modernism, and we even now call it post-modernism. Post-modernism, if you will look it up, you'll find it is really quite a weird ideology system, but it's growing. It's growing on university campuses. It's growing in population centers around the world. The more secular a culture is, the more postmodern uh, it, it, or the values it's embracing. So it's, it's quite, 
is quite a disturbing thing, postmodernism. As we look at this, we find these things. They reject the truth. They rely upon human understanding. They change the truths of God into lies. And as this systematic change becomes ingrained, it begins to color all of the various areas and avenues of our lives. It affects everything, how we dress. It affects our relationships, our friendships, our vocations, uh, how we interact with humanity, how we interact with family, how we interact at church. It begins to affect everything. It's like cancer. It begins in one spot in the body, and then it just eats all of the living, healthy cells until it has destroyed from within, not from without. Cancer destroys from within. Sin does the same thing. As this world walks further and further and further away from God and further and further and further into the darkness, the spiritual darkness of Satanism, the world will grow more and more wicked and more and more evil. That brings us to the fourth. Culture embraces personal indulgence and perversion. Now watch. Let's look at it. Verse 26. For this cause, because of these changes we've just read about, for this cause, in verse 26, God gave them up. Underline that phrase, God gave them up. God takes his hand off. Some people today are wondering why God is not punishing evil. Actually, he is, but it's radically different than how we imagine punishment. God has removed his hand. God gave them up. He took off the governors. He essentially took down all the stop signs and red lights. There are no more white lines on the margins of the road. All the boundaries have been laid aside. And here's what he says, unto vile affections. The boundaries were being contested. Then they were trespassed. And now they're simply being removed. No boundaries. People do not want boundaries, either personal boundaries or any other boundaries. When we speed down the highway, we have rationalized and justified what we are doing because we are in a hurry or we're running late or this reason or that reason or the other. We have taken even the most basic laws, common sense laws, and we have pushed against the boundaries. All of us have done it. Now listen, this, this is a cultural marker that indicates that the culture has walked away from God. We're living with things that our forefathers would have not only blushed about, they would have forbidden it. It would have been forbidden. You say, well, we're more in light today. Well, that takes us back to verse 22. We've professed ourselves to be wise, but we're really nothing but fools. Listen, if God has not changed, and he has not, then the way he sees sin has not changed either. So it's important for us. These are important things. He says, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even the women did change their natural use into that which is against nature. There's a whole panorama of uh, feminine cultural mores and values uh, that are in this phrase, that women change the natural use. And, and godly Christian authors would be, women authors would be far more capable of addressing the specifics on this. But it's not just about lesbianism and homosexuality, although we'll talk about that. That's certainly a part. But it's going to be on that. Women now can abort their babies with no conscience. Killing their, the living child within their body is now something thought to be merely convenient. It's necessary in order for us to go on with our lives. 
it's wicked and it's vile. And the fact that we have, we have made it okay in our minds makes it even more wicked. Verse 27, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman. Now again, this is about more than homosexuality. Men are not treating women the way God intended men to treat women. And women are not tolerating men to treat them the way God intended for man to treat woman. God created woman to come alongside the man. They're to be one flesh. God had very specific instructions for both Adam and for Eve in this role, and he's recorded and revealed these things consistently through the scriptures. Proverbs 31 is a great chapter for the wife. Ephesians 5 is a great passage for the man. It's time we got back to biblical masculinity and biblical femininity to be the man and woman God created. So when it says, likewise, the men leaving the natural use of the woman, there's so much more here than the overt statement, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men. People say the Bible says nothing about homosexuality. They have not read the Bible. Romans chapter 1 is clear. Other places are clear. Leviticus very definitely, very pointed says, Thou shalt not lie with men as with woman. You can't get around it. It's an abomination in the sight of God. That's not popular these days. People say it's intolerant. Listen, if we ever get more tolerant than God is, we're in trouble. If we ever become more intolerant than God is, we're in trouble. But the Bible is very, very clear. God did not create man to be with other men in intimacy. He did not create women to be with other women in intimacy. God made a difference in our bodies. He made a difference in our mental makeup. He made a difference in our emotional composition. He made us different. And that difference is to compensate, is to come together and complete God's original plan and purpose. But see, culture embraces the personal indulgence. We simply want no boundaries. And these boundaries will take us deeper and deeper and deeper into perversions. Listen, there are things that human beings are doing right now that we cannot even mention. They're that disgusting. They are that perverse. They are that unnatural. It's just, it, it's, it boggles the human mind the things that humans are permitting and engaging in under the guise of indulgence. And they, they say to us, you are hateful, you're intolerant because you draw a straight line in morals. Listen, he says here, they leave the natural use of the woman, they burned in lust one toward another, men with men, Working or doing that which is unseemly or unnatural. Now watch. It doesn't say God is okay with it. It doesn't say God has a neutral position. It says here, and receiving in themselves that recompense or that reward of their error, which was made or suitable. Listen, there are consequences to our behavior. We're seeing those consequences in our culture. And because the church has compromised and watered down its beliefs and its values and its, its standards, the church is paying the same price as the world pays in these things. Hard is truth. And it's only hard because we've compromised. Let that truth sink in. These things are only hard. Listen, dear friend, these things I'm saying today are only hard because we've moved. There was a time not that long ago when the very things we're reading here would have been taboo. It would not have even been mentioned. There was a time in the American church we didn't even talk about these things. We didn't talk about them. Why? They were intolerable because they were abominable in the sight of God. We, not God, we have moved. And so culture begins to embrace these personal indulgences. 
Now listen, when that happens, here's what happens in verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now, a reprobate mind is a seared mind. It, it is beyond the consciousness. It's beyond conviction, and it's beyond repentance. They see no wrong in what they're doing. Some of these protests that we've seen this year, uh, we've seen some horrible things, images in the streets, people in all various forms of perversion, flaunting their perversion, things we can't even discuss. They flaunt it in the open streets of our cities. They have no conscience anymore. They see no wrong in what they're doing. Not only that, they see us as wrong for being uh, resistant to it, for being intolerant of it. Now listen, as long as the Bible says what it says, and it's not going to change, I will be intolerant of these behaviors. I will stand against them. I will speak against them. I will do my best to love those people and share the gospel of Christ with them, but I will not tolerate those things. Why? The Bible says they are wrong, they're sinful, they are wicked, they are perverse. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. What does that do? It says to them in verse 28, to do those things which are not convenient. To do those things which are not convenient. So listen, as we read these words here, we can see it. It's all over. I mean, if you can't read America into this chapter, uh, then somehow or another we've missed the point. Listen, this is the world in which you and I live today. This is the culture that is dominant around us. Now, in verse 29 and 30 and 31, these three verses detail for us the, the outcomes. We'll talk more about this next week, but uh, we find exactly what happens when culture chooses these uh, these things and culture goes down this path as opposed to the path of truth and righteousness and biblical living, biblical values. When this happens, there is only one result possible. Now listen carefully on this. As we wrap things up today, I want you to see this. When culture rejects the revealed truth, when culture relies upon human understanding and reasoning, when culture changes the truth of God into lies, when culture embraces personal indulgence and perversion, there is only one possible divine response. Only one. Only one. It starts with God withdrawing his hand. We saw that. We saw that back in the preceding verses. God gave them up. God gave them up. Then God turned them over in verse 28. The final response from God is wrath. Wrath. Look at verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that word, that phrase, judgment of God, means God's way of discerning. It's not merely a verdict. It's God's way of thinking. Listen, I've been teaching for years that we as children of God must come to a place where we adopt, we abandon our perspective and we adopt God's perspective because God's perspective is the only one that's right. God's perspective is the only truth. Knowing the judgment of God, knowing how God thinks about these things, knowing how what God has declared about these things, that they which do these things, such things, are worthy of death. Worthy of death. They are already under the condemnation of Almighty God. It's sad. It's awful. It's, it's beyond our understanding. It's beyond our comprehension. But every moment of every hour of every day, human beings are dropping from this world into the pits of hell, and they are being tormented there. That's fact. That's reality. It's a sad reality, but it is reality. And they're going to hell because they 
not God. God did not reject them. They rejected God. They rejected the truth of the scriptures. They chose their path. And our choices have consequences. You say, but God should give them opportunity. God has given them opportunity every single day. However long you live, this number of years and the number of opportunities that God has given you to, to make the right choices, to respond to him rather than reject him. Dear friend, you have no excuse. If you're lost, man or woman today, you have no excuse. You've heard the truth. You're hearing it now. You've heard it over and over and over. Every day you say, you know what? I'm not sure I believe that. Or you're saying, you know, if I do that, I'm going to lose my friends. I may lose my job. I may lose. Listen, as long as those are your responses, you're rejecting the truth and you're rejecting God. There is no other alternative but God's judgment and wrath upon you. The only solution for sinners is the blood of Jesus Christ. Dear friend, if I could get on my hands and knees and beg you to be saved, to repent of your sin and turn to Christ today, I would do that readily without any reservation or hesitation because, dear friend, otherwise you're headed straight to hell. And I say that lovingly. We're reading about things here that we see every day all around us in our culture. There is no denying that what we're reading here that Paul wrote in the first century A.D., these things are real today. These are the cultural values and uh, views of our present time. And God says they are worthy of wrath. They are worthy of death. But notice there's another phrase here. Not only that do the same, but have pleasure in them that do it. Our entertainment media today has made these entertainment things in our movies, pornography, R and X-rated material. People have found pleasure and indulgence in these things. And God says those, you may not actually do them, but if you take pleasure in them, you're just as guilty. You're just as guilty. Be careful, dear friend. Now, culture is walking away from God. It will continue to do so in mass. The only hope that we have in this present time is to become countercultural. We've got to stop in our tracks, turn away from the world, and turn to Jesus Christ. I cannot describe it any simpler. That's the only alternative we have. We must repent and we must turn. We must reject the culture of this world and we must embrace the culture of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, we're out of time today. We're going to look more and more at the specifics of how this cultural uh, rebellion against God reveals itself in daily life next week and beyond. Next week, if you would, spend some time studying these verses uh, 29, 30, 31 in Romans 1. And also, I would encourage you to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll be looking more at 2 Timothy next week as well. As we go down these days of closing out 2020, as we look into uh, the time of the new year just approaching, Listen, for us who follow Jesus Christ, we need to realize evil may see, be so dominant now, but it's not going to win. Jesus Christ sits on the throne. He rules everyone, everything, everywhere, all the time. It's going to be okay, but for now we are in the midst of the battle for the hearts and souls and beings of Americans and people around the world. I hope that you enjoy the Christmas holiday season. I hope that you'll spend time in the Word of God. I hope that you'll find your joy and your peace, your faith in Christ. And until this time next week, God bless you and have a great week.